coming up in this episode. Metallic Chaos. And Jeeps. That is all. I'm looking for something to do. That's what she said. And I'm gonna build a Jeep today. <gasps> and now you're gonna wash my Jeep, boy. Hey, you there. Do you like Jeeps? Good. Because neither do I. Now if you're observant, you'll notice that this is not a V10 Patrol episode. It's there. I'm not touching it for a while. You can thank Australia Post for this, for taking absolutely bloody ages to send my parts. That's why you have to endure a Jeep episode. So if you've been watching my nonsense for a while, you'll know that I've had several run-ins with Jeeps, and they were all involuntary. So why do I keep ending up with this rubbish in my workshop? Well, Jeeps are like terminal illnesses. They'll show up when you don't want them, and when they're here, you want them gone as soon as possible. But this one, as far as Jeeps go, is the most equipped one I've ever seen. And it's mine. So let's go over some of the things it's got. Starting with the engine bay. We don't need these here. So what are we dealing with? Firstly, it's the relatively bulletproof 4-litre six-cylinder, with excessive amounts of aftermarket things. Unfortunately, this means aftermarket wiring. And as with any vehicle that has aftermarket wiring, everything you look at is pretty rubbish. I mean, as far as mongoloid wiring goes, this isn't too bad, but you end up with mystery things. Like, why would you put an earth like that going to there? But it has all the necessary things, and everything's not done too terribly in a dangerous way, so they've used connectors and heat shrink and stuff like that. I'd give it about a 4 out of 10 on the Brain Dead Builders scale. It's also got this weird compressor here that goes off to two different directions. This is twin locked by ARB. But on the flip side, you have an airbox with a lot of PVC piping on board, which goes down to here, which is the normal place. Why is this a big gaping hole? Well, it used to be attached to a PVC snorkel, but the previous owner decided it would be a good idea to introduce this snorkel to a tree. I wonder who that was. Interior crocodile alligator. Anyway, my first thought was to completely ditch this abomination, but then I had a closer look at it. And I realized that even though it is a PVC piece of pipe, it's been quite skillfully bent up to accommodate various contours of the vehicle. Now, unfortunately, PVC is extremely fragile, and hand-to-hand -hand combat with trees results in this. So what's on the inside? Not much, because it's a Jeep. But seeing as it's the fancy 65th anniversary one, you can tell by the seats, it's got things like cruise control, a six-speed gearbox, and I'm not really sure what else. Maybe something to do with the rearview mirror. I don't know. On the outside, we've got things like ball bars with winches and lights that aren't really necessary. A load of aftermarket steering components with ARB and other random logos on them. And it's the same story at the back. Now, whoever built this car had a fetish with airlines, and they decided to go for these Rancho air-assisted shocks. And there's a separate compressor for that. Completely bloody pointless, but it's there. So seeing as this is my garbage YouTube channel, you might be asking yourself, why is this car in here? Well, unfortunately, it's plagued by the many problems of neglectful owners. So let's take a look at those neglectful problems. Now, the first problem is stupid cars with long arm kits, under there somewhere, are an absolute pain in the weenus to lift in the air. And this is because there's nothing really for these arms to go onto, and you end up with a rickety, horrible mess. Anyway, that's problem one. Moving on. I drive a Chevrolet movie theater. So allow me to introduce the sketchiest lift I've ever done on this hoist. Now typically when you're using a hoist, you put the pads somewhere between these two mounts for the radius arm. And if I did that, they'd be about 50 centimeters apart and it would probably fall off the hoist by rocking backwards and forwards. Now I know people say you can lift off rock sliders and stuff like that, but obviously when you're lifting a whole car just off the rock sliders, it's a little bit sketchy, especially when they're through bolted like this. Anyway, loss of life aside, let's find out what's wrong with this horrible creation. Firstly, it has multi-axis wheel bearings, and that's visible with your eyes. If you know anything, you'll see how bad that is. There's a wonderful leak from the axle seal in the back. A leak from the rear differential. 
that I didn't realize about until now. Now this is not my first time being underneath this car in its life. And as you can see, these radius arms look quite nice and well maintained. And then you flip over to this side. What the bloody hell is that all about? And these are painted with a brush. So what are we going to use to fix all this disgraceful nonsense? Damn it! The answer is a lot of things. Now that reminds me that it also has a Toyota handbrake. Anyway, I'm going to start at the front and work my way back, starting with those disgraceful wheel bearings. Now these look like that relatively convenient type of wheel bearing that you get on newer Navaras, where it's like one big unit, you just unbolt it and bolt the new one on. And usually, I hate using impact guns. I think today that's inevitable. It's never a good sign when the first thing you see... Focus. is a big fat chisel mark. Yes, this is the growth serum bottle. But you should always clean your threads before taking off your nuts. Because otherwise you're just embedding all that crap into your nut. It's gonna get jammed and break and strip threads and all kinds of horrible nasties. Remember future me, that's where the washer thing goes. Are you triggered yet? Why does everything I work on have to contain excessive amounts of spiders? So, step one of removing wheel bearings. Start with the wishful thinking. I'm glad that worked. Well, that's not too bad. Looks can be deceiving. But this greasy little pocket is looking quite healthy. That's apart what she from the bearing. Said. Which says good things about what's going on in there. I'm not sure why that came out like it. I only put a bit of zinc coat on to prevent a bit more rust, but you're never gonna see it. Now this middle nut here is supposed to be done up to about 230 Newton meters. Not going to have much luck doing that, seeing as it's spinning around. But I have this fancy impact gun, fresh from China, that'll hopefully let me do it. No idea how accurate it is, but let's find out. Now this will stop when it's at the right torque. And that should be it. And these last three on the back are apparently 102 Newton meters. It was at this moment that he knew he fucked up. Yes, I found out the hard way. This is backwards. This side is exactly the same. 
so I'm not going to do it on video. What I will do though, is show you exactly how bad this bearing is. How in the hell? Now this car is fitted with a long arm kit, and what that means is basically your radius arms that go from your chassis to your diff are longer than they normally are. And what this does, it allows more articulation. In theory, I'm sure it doesn't do that much because it's very dependent on the length of your shocks anyway. Maybe it's easier to see like this. Now the geometry of these I think is all set wrong because the thing handles like shit, but I'm assuming most of it came from those wheel bearings. Anyway, these front ones were done a while ago. They were done really nicely, but then someone came along and painted them with a brush. Why? So I'm going to go through and undo all that nonsense, and then get these ones at the rear to the same standard as the ones at the front. So the first step is, pull everything out. And then while I'm doing that, hope that the whole car doesn't fall on my head. Now all four of the arms are basically the same as this. You've basically got rose joints there and there, and these allow you to adjust the whole length of this bit as well as this bit. Now you might recognize this Jeep from a previous video, and you probably saw some of the strange goings on about what happens when this thing goes off road. And I'm pretty sure that all that nonsense was caused by these measurements being out of spec. Now I know I said I'd overhauled these in the past, but the car hasn't been driven since I've done them. And I figured I may as well do all four while they're there. Anyway, the important thing here is following the bloody instructions. And that basically tells you exactly what the manufacturers say that these lengths should be for this kit. If you don't do that, you're an idiot. Now, unfortunately, Jeeps are American. That means that all the measurements are in inches. So I need to set these to 29 and 3 quarter inches. Now that one is 15 and a quarter inches now. It seems that another mystery of the shitty handling has been uncovered. Bolts tighten and loosen. They're not supposed to do that. So what I'm guessing is that this lock nut has been loose for a very long time, allowing this to kind of vibrate like that, and it'll gradually wear away at the threads. This is why you have to make sure your bolts are tight. Now this bit feels a bit buggered, and then it gets to there, and the threads start working again. So ideally I'd want to replace this whole arm. But the more I loosen that, the more normal the threads are getting. So I can assume that the threads in here are fine, but I'm gonna have to replace this little bush bit. Yeah, there's hardly any play in that now. Well, unfortunately, that's put a bit of a downer on things. So what I'm gonna do is take out the other side and see if it doesn't have the same problem. But until then, I'm waiting for parts. So it's now a new day in the land of Jeep. And since then, I've suffered from two perforated eardrums. So in most of this video, I'll probably be like this. How did I do that? Reasons. Anyway, since the sound of loud noises makes me want to die, I'm probably gonna be talking louder than I normally would because I have ear defenders on. Anyway, everything here, all nicely painted and fitted where it should go, hopefully adjusted to the correct lengths. And this leads me on nicely to the last bit of the reason why this Jeep is still up in the air. The rubbish handbrake, and the weird leaky axle seal thing. So let's take a look at that. Over the top to Brooks. Delightful. Now this is not exactly ideal. Everything's full of oil here, so it's obviously been leaking for a very long time. 
And taking this apart has confirmed my suspicions that this is going to be a horrible job. Now my first thoughts of this being a horrible job was when I first looked at this replacement seal kit. And what you get is one bearing and a weird little collar and then you get the seal as well. And what this tells me from my limited experience is that all of this is going to have to be pressed onto the shaft. This means that even though the bearings are perfectly fine, you have to replace everything just to replace the seal. Thanks Jeep. Well I guess the first step is to see if that is actually the case, but if you've seen that bit included in the video, it was the case. And what I'm seeing here is that this is most likely an access hole, so you can access these bolts that are holding the retainer plate in, which are going to let the shaft be pulled out. And I've done this style before. They're horrible. Now this job would be a lot easier if you had the proper press that was big enough. If you could fit this entire shaft in upright, you could then press these bearings out from the top. So the easy option is just to grind most of the way through it, and then chisel it, and then slide it off. And if you do it with a bit of skill, like this egomaniac, the shaft is completely untouched. Anyway, future me, remember what order these things go in. Now this might be a point of contention to some people, but the general rule is, if you can see it, check it, but if you can't feel it, it's not a problem. So it's not a problem. Now part of the reason why I think that Jeeps have a crap design here is because once it's all pressed on, you can't really take it off again without destroying it. So let's say for example I put this little flange on the wrong way. It's not, but then I'd have to chop off these bearings again and buy new ones just to flip this around. Oh, rubbish! Lastly, is using completely recognised methods to press all these things onto the necessary shaft. Allow me to introduce optimal OSHA safety. And this is because obviously I need a long bit of distance for the shaft to go into before I press it in. Anyway, I've cheated. This already works. I've pressed on the first bearing. Only thing that's left to do is put on this weird little spacer. So I'm going to do that. Remember, if I've done anything wrong at this point, I have to start again with all new parts. As is tradition, that didn't go to plan. It went a little bit cockeyed on the press. And it's done. As you can see, it was completely seamless and nothing went wrong and there were no random bits of metal flying around the workshop. So now it gives me an opportunity to look at this. The handbrake. The handbrake that looks like it's been in a paddock for 20 years, covered in oil. Now drum brakes are basically the same on all vehicles. You've got tension springs, top and bottom. Retainers. That one's obviously doing something wrong. These weird spreader bits and something to make it spread further when you press the button or pull the lever. That's what she said. As well as a little just a bit. And basically all I'm going to do is just rip it all out, replace these two bits, clean it all up and put the springs back in. And I figured it would be much easier to do it this way because otherwise I've got a big hub here that's stopping my access to all of the springs.
And that's about as clean as I'm prepared to make it because I'm bored. If you actually know what you're doing, shout something out in the comments if I've done it wrong. Handbrake and axle seal. And I'm going to do the other side, but not on camera, because it's exactly the same. So for all you know, this is all done. Now you might have wondered why you saw a different wheel in that shot. Here's why. Australian police are absolute bloody menaces. And seeing as that sticks out about 100 mil past the flares, you're basically asking to get defected. So that's why. Now this part of the exercise is nothing special. It's a radiator. And the old one has either a combination of a leaking radiator or a leaking radiator hose. So to avoid any fucking around, I'm going to replace it all. Now luckily the one I've ordered is exactly the same as the one that's coming out. Which is not necessarily a good thing, because this is the cheapest one I could find on eBay that actually looked like it would work. So the previous owner obviously did the same. Anyway, seeing as I've made enough of a mess on the floor there draining the coolant, I should probably lower the car the rest of the way and get the radiator out. Now this is hopefully going to be very straightforward. The radiator shroud is held on by zip ties, thanks previous owner. Then there's about two bolts, two hoses, and then it should come out. Now it wouldn't be a modification if it didn't have evidence of expert mechanics in the works. So you've got one cap head bolt here, down there, there's some kind of random 13 mil headed bolt there. And on this side, it's pretty much the same. At least they were consistent. Now all I have to do is just play spot the difference. And there don't seem to be any. I can ignore these, because these I believe are for an automatic transmission cooler. Which obviously I don't need, being a manual. And aside from that, it looks like it'll just bolt straight in. One thing I will say, don't use stainless steel bolts on aluminium. It's one of the stupidest things you can do. Basically, stainless and aluminium are almost at opposite ends of the galvanic reaction table. I mean, thankfully this one's had a galvanized washer that's been sandwiched between it, but if that wasn't there and there was direct contact, add a catalyst like salt water, and this radiator would have just dissolved, basically. The other reason it didn't happen is because of these rivnuts that are isolating the stainless from it. But it's not worth the risk, so don't do it. Well, this has turned into an expensive mistake. That's the new radiator. And it turns out that this radiator is five mil thicker than the old one. And what that does is it pushes it right into the middle of the fan hub, which is that bit. But I'm not too fussed by it. Everyone makes mistakes. And in the grand scheme of things, it could have been a much bigger mistake. And seeing as I've done most of this build feeling like my ears are going to explode out of my head, I guess it was kind of expected. So just for the purposes of testing, I've put the old radiator back on, but I've left the radiator shroud off. And this is just so I can see any leaks that might happen on the radiator. So it's another day in the land of Jeep. And it's a Sunday, so it's quiet. So I don't have to wear my hearing protection to stop my head from feeling like it's going to explode. Anyway, here's the problem I found today. This Jeep is fitted with this diabolical steering arrangement. I'm not sure why. I don't really see any real advantage to it. And when you turn past more than say about 10 degrees, using the standard sized wheels, they decide they want to get very intimate. Now I already have a lathe, so sadly I have to put these stupid badly offset wheels back on. This does not warrant a thumbs up.
Now the last thing I'm going to do while this car is having a wee is some of the electrics over here. Now I may have been slightly harsh before, it's basically all relatively okay, except it's obviously unsheathed. There's one or two that are inadequately taped. And then obviously you've got the bullshit earths that don't seem to have an apparent purpose. Anyway, I've removed all these. There's a hell of a lot of positives for some reason on this terminal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move them up to the fuse box here, because that's what these posts are designed for. And it's basically going to be a case of trying to make it look a little bit less like a bird's nest. Maybe I'll do a side-by-side -side comparison, but this is about as far as I'm willing to go. Now I'm sure you've all seen better, but I'm also sure you've also seen a lot worse. And if you don't see a problem, then you're part of it. And you're contributing to the reason why builds like this exist. Now lastly, is this. I'm not going to call it a snorkel anymore. I don't know why anyone would call it a snorkel. It's now a raised air intake. Thanks for that loophole, Toyota. Anyway, here's what I've done. Now, seeing as the whole thing is made from PVC pipe, expertly formed, this means that I can also repair it with a piece of PVC pipe. This cost me a dollar. And what I'm going to do is drill the two holes in the same place, riv nut those, and then I'm going to go around and probably rivet this in place in a few spots. It's far from ideal, but neither is this entire project. And this last one is a little drain hole because I'm going to put a little duckbill valve in there. Because when I took this off, there was a fair bit of water in here because it's like a toilet U-bend. The water's able to go there and it pools below the air filter. As you can see here, basically goes in there up to the air box. So that'll just let it drain. I forgot something. Because how else is anyone going to know it's a Jeep? Don't worry, we're almost there. The last thing to do to a disgraceful off-roader is put a very inappropriate roof on it. And this roof is just a tent. What were you thinking, Jeep? So ends the arduous task of getting a Jeep to a standard where it's the least rubbish. So what better than to end this episode in the style of a true Jeep owner? Bye!